We're past the midpoint of the semester. Let's review what we should take away from last time. The APA sets out two distinct ways judicial review may be precluded. Either way, the case for preclusion must be clear and convincing. But as to statutory preclusion, that only means that Congress's intent to preclude can be fairly discerned. If possible, statutes will be read not to preclude judicial review if separation of powers issues would arise. Statutory preclusion may apply to certain issues and not others, and to certain parties and not others. Committed to agency discretion by law preclusion applies to certain traditionally unreviewable categories of agency action, such as decisions not to take enforcement action and allocation of lump sum appropriations among permissible projects. Committed to agency discretion by law preclusion only presumptively applies to agency refusals to take enforcement action. The presumption is rebuttable if there are statutory enforcement guidelines, or the agency's sole reason is a claimed lack of authority, or an expressly adopted general policy amounting to an abdication of its statutory responsibilities. A denial of a rulemaking petition is not presumptively unreviewable, unlike an agency refusal to take enforcement action. Let's put the issue of preclusion aside. Now we turn to the question, may this party have judicial review? This is the issue of standing to sue. We want to distinguish preclusion of certain parties and claims, statutory or committed to discretion by law, and the issue of standing. Standing is an issue that arises under Article 3. To do this, let's look at some cases. The agency action at issue in Data Processors versus Camp was one taken by the Comptroller of the Currency. To understand the issue, you have to remember that this case arose when computers were very big, very temperamental, and very, very expensive. What you see here is a computer that was probably inferior in every way to a smartphone, and certainly less powerful than a laptop. Big companies like banks could afford them, but smaller businesses could not, and had to rent time from companies that did own computers. The Comptroller announced a decision to allow banks to compete with non-bank data processors. Incidental to its banking services, a national bank may make available its data processing equipment or perform data processing services for other banks and bank customers. And bank customers. Well, every business is going to have a bank account. So the agency is allowing banks to compete with non-bank data processors. And the banks ought to have an edge in the competition since businesses needing their data to be processed already have a relationship with a bank. And all the banks had better jump in or risk losing customers to other banks. But the non-bank processors point to the statute the Comptroller is supposed to be following. Under the Bank Service Corporation Act, no bank service corporation may engage in any activity other than the performance of bank services for banks. The Comptroller seems to be allowing bank service corporations to provide data services rather than banking services for non-banks. Here's a question. Suppose the Comptroller had made no ruling, but instead had simply ignored what American National Bank was doing. there would be a committed to agency discretion by law preclusion issue apart from the standing issue. But in data processes, the comptroller had issued a regulation, 
Possibly it was contrary to the statute. But why should a court get involved? Notice the unusual structure of the relationships in this case. We have four actors in this drama. The controller of the currency, the banks, the data processors, and the court. The data processors say they are being hurt by the banks. But the data processors are suing the comptroller. They want the court to make the comptroller do something. Do something to the banks to make them stop competing. Compare this to the structure of ordinary litigation involving an agency. The run-of-the-mill case involves only three parties, not four. The three being the plaintiff, the agency, and the court. The complaint for judicial review is that the agency is doing something that harms the plaintiff. And the plaintiff asks the court to make it stop. Compare the two patterns. As the court explained in the Lujan case, when the plaintiff is not himself the object of the government action or inaction he challenges, standing is not precluded, but it is ordinarily substantially more difficult to establish. The Lujan opinion continues, when a plaintiff's asserted injury arises from the government's allegedly unlawful regulation or lack of regulation of someone else, much more is needed. As Justice Douglas puts it, standing is different. By that he meant the issue of standing is a threshold question bearing on the court's jurisdiction. This question arises because of the limitation of the judicial power stated in Article 3. Section 2. The judicial power shall extend to all cases arising under this Constitution and the laws of the United States and to controversies to which the United States shall be a party. Cases and controversies. The key term is case or controversy. The court has always regarded the case or controversy requirement as not satisfied by mere dispute or difference of opinion. The court is not a debating society. What sets it apart is that disputants must show that they have a personal stake in the outcome as opposed to an abstract interest. This assures that parties who invoke the court's jurisdiction represent interests manifesting concrete adverseness and not mere debating positions or even collusive manipulation of the court. This in turn sharpens the presentation and renders the issues fit for judicial decision. But the sources of standing doctrine do not originate in Article 3 alone. The court's cases on standing identify that source, but two others as well, judicial and statutory. The constitutional source is Article 3's case or controversy requirement. The judicial source is so-called prudential abstention. The continuing viability of the court's prudential standing doctrines was questioned in Justice Scalia's opinion for a unanimous accord in the case of Lexmark International versus Static Controls. The opinion suggested that prudential standing may better be understood merely as an aspect of either constitutional or statutory standing doctrine. A statutory sources of standing doctrine are the APA zone of interests test and others, for example, citizen suit and private attorney general provisions. Let's look at the APA's contribution to standing doctrine. APA Section 702 Right of Review reads, A person suffering legal wrong because of agency action or ad adversely affected or aggrieved by agency action within the meaning of a relevant statute is entitled to judicial review thereof. 
adversely affected or aggrieved. This language probably adds nothing to what Article 3 already requires. As we shall see, the case or controversy requirement is understood already to require a complaining party to, so, to show some injury in fact that is actual or imminent and caused by the agency. It is not easy to conceive a party suffering an injury in fact who would not automatically count as adversely affected or aggrieved. The addition the APA makes is this qualification, within the meaning of a relevant statute. In other words, the adverse effect must fall within the zone of interests associated with the statute the agency is alleged to have violated. This APA addition makes standing harder to establish, but only seldom has it made a difference. Decisions of the court have repeatedly stated that the zone of interest test is not especially demanding and that there is uh, no need to show a congressional intent to benefit the party seeking judicial review. In data processors, Congress did not intend to benefit the non-bank data processors by requiring banks to stick to their knitting, uh, banking, but the non-bank data processors were found to have standing anyway. In fact, the court has found Article III standing but no zone of interest in only one case. In Air Couriers Conference versus American Postal Workers, the Postal Workers Union sued the Postmaster General for permitting carriers to bypass the Postal Service by sending mail in bulk overseas by courier. A unanimous court conceded that the union showed an Article III injury in fact. Po postal workers' job security was undermined by the agency action. But the court held that the union flunked the not especially demanding zone of interest test because Congress had not intended to benefit postal workers. Go figure. Once the court is looking at Congress's intent, it seems that it is asking and answering questions that go to the merits. In Clark v. Securities Industry Association, the court held that a citizen suit provision is sufficient but not necessary to satisfy the zone of interest requirement. A citizen suit provision in a statute is a provision that expressly states that citizens generally, or some specific subset of them, may initiate judicial review of an agency's action. Similarly, a private attorney general provision authorizes private parties to initiate enforcement actions against other private parties. In our next case, Lujan versus Defenders of Wildlife, we will come back to the question whether a citizen suit provision automatically confers Article III standing. <laughs>